This is Trepwire Week in Review for week ending October 16th. I'm Martha Kocher with Trep, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS commercial real estate and CLO markets. Joining me are Manus Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Joe McBride, Head of CRE Finance. This week, seven months into the pandemic and 19 days until the presidential election, the economic data confirms that the recovery is grinding forward but losing steam. Weekly jobless claims spiked. Manufacturing data shows growth but is mixed across regions. Q3 bank earnings were mixed as well and pulled downward by low interest rates. And a survey says that more Americans are worried about their financial situation than they were in May of this year. COVID cases continue to surge in Europe and in the U.S. Meanwhile, stocks were pulled down by the latest round of news. Manus, what's your read of consumer and investor sentiment? Well, last week we talked about how we were living and dying by the stimulus and whether that was going to get pushed over the, the finish line. And, and here and there, there are rumors that, that uh, Congress and the White House are, are talking. Um, but I think everybody has kind of uh, become resolved to the fact that there won't be anything um, to stimulate the economy until after Election Day. So I think now we turn all of our attention for the next three weeks to the election itself which I think uh, is the real um, next big thing that could uh, move the needle in, in one way or the other. Um, you know, it is clearly a case where there could be many different outcomes. We could see a democratic sweep, right, would, which would lead to um, a whole new set of rules and uh, maybe a heavier hand um, on banks and, and a couple of other things. We could see a mixed Congress um, and either a Democrat or Republican president, which is probably more palatable to the markets, um, I would think. Um, but at this point, I think that's, that's where all the eyes are right now to see how this plays out and what we're looking at as of November 4th. Yeah, well, we had <clears throat> increased... Uh filings for jobless claims this week, which was a little bit uh, negative for us. I think the the estimate was around 830,000. It came in above that 898,000. That's the highest level since August. Uh, this may be, you know, the beginnings, or maybe it's not the beginnings, maybe it's the continuation of the second downward uh, trend in that W-shaped recovery that Casey Conway spoke about. We did see mixed economic data, as Martha was referring to. Um, interestingly, a pair of manufacturing numbers that came out today, uh, even though they were both from northeastern states, the numbers couldn't have been more uh, dramatically different. Um, in New York State, people were expecting a dip in the Empire State survey. Uh, it did dip from the September number, and it came in modestly below uh, estimates. So indications of a slowing economy there, yet the Philadelphia Fed index today just blew away expectations. Um, so, you know, I think if you're trying to, you know, read the economic numbers and, and, and try to get some kind of uh, macro trend or meta trend out of this, it's really difficult right now. Um, beyond that, when you look at earnings, you see some banks just completely blowing away expectations like Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs uh, on the help of uh, really high trading revenue, which nobody really anticipated. Um, and then on the other side, you see big misses from Wells Fargo and others. So it's just as it's very hard right now to get a beat on what this country looks like electorally after November 4th um, between Congress and the presidency, it's equally hard to know whether we're going to get a stimulus or not, and it's equally hard to make head or tail out of the economic data we're seeing at this point. Manis, turning to CMBS, we've seen stories this week uh, that show signs of values in retail taking a hit. Yeah, it was an, an interesting week um, for sure. A lot of the stories came from um, New York City street-level retail, which... Interestingly, like the hotel market in, in Manhattan, it had been a little bit under siege pre-COVID, and now it is just a, a complete mess. So we saw several stories this week, some of which we'll cover in Trepwire over the next couple of days. 
The first was um, the Wall Street Journal was reporting that uh, three New York City buildings in the Silk Stocking District, which would be the, the Upper East Side, um, which contains uh, Fifth Avenue, where you have stores like Michael Kors and uh, other jewelers and high-end fashion and so forth at street level and Madison Avenue. Three buildings were sold there. It was primarily retail, but there was a little bit of residential. They were sold for $45 million, which the article notes was uh, an 80% discount to where that market was trading in 2014 at the peak of that market, which just goes to show uh, just how obliterated um, the valuation of street level retail has been. In Trepwire, we've written stories about um, borrowers being ready to throw back the keys on properties where uh, the tenants uh, at the street level have uh, moved on, leaving those vacant. Sometimes those, those properties, even though the retail space represents five or 10% of the uh, footprint of the entire building, could represent 70% of the income. So we've covered some of those before, but we did point out after this Wall Street Journal story broke that there are other properties on Madison Avenue where the retail segment of the property was appraised for, let's say, $10,000 a square foot on an appraised value basis, give or take, um, with you know upwards of $70 million loans on Madison Avenue. Yet this most recent sale valued the retail segment at only about $1,000 a square foot. So a real plummeting of that market. Um, that was followed up by uh, Hugo Boss announcing that they were suing to get out of their lease at 3 Columbus Circle. That's more of a shopping destination. It's at the southwest corner of Central Park uh, for the marathon runners out there. It's right near the finish line of the New York City Marathon. Um, it has a Whole Foods and, and other uh, retail segments in that property, but Hugo Boss is on the hook for 8.3 million um, over the course of the next four years. And they have said, you know, we don't believe we should have to pay for this at this point. So um, a couple of things going on there that uh, are quite concerning for that part of the market. So uh, last week when we were uh, recording the podcast, uh, uh, or when we were done re recording the podcast, I really felt like I didn't give my my all, my A plus effort. I think I was a little bit tired. We had had a hundred meetings that day, so I came prepared today. And while Manus was talking, I was actually running queries. Uh, so in real time data analysis on the podcast, you know, we did this analysis maybe two or three weeks ago about new appraisals. So I just look, I just pulled all of the data for. Um, appraisals that have been redone uh, since February. And if we look at it on a on an average percentage change basis, so that means like a, a $10 million mall and a $100 million mall get the same weight uh, in the outcome. For retail, we saw almost 42% average drop. Uh, now, some of that might, there might be some portfolio loans in there where it's, you know, parts of the portfolio have been sold off. So maybe those are kind of over inflating or deflating that number. And then in lodging, it was about 35%, which is in line with what we talked about before. If you talk about it on a, like a, a volume or a, a value weighted basis, retail is about 32% and lodging is about 36%. So we did see that big um, Park Plaza Mall in. Little Rock, Arkansas, that was probably the, the worst of them all, which had seen its value drop from 142 million to, I believe, 33 Seven. million uh, recently, which yep. is just 33. Crushingly, and that's a big loan. So that's going to be a 7% really, drop. Right. Yeah. And, and for those that think that this is um, abnormal uh, in terms of valuation drops, um, what we found during the 2005 to 2010 period even before the great financial crisis, was that once a mall becomes obsolete, uh, either through competition or age uh, or demographics or anything else, it's not that unusual to see losses of greater than 80% of the loan balance. Um, we will see that again probably in this cycle, but we saw it dozens of times uh, in 
05 to 08 with malls just being liquidated for, you know, five or $10 million on a property that had been worth a hundred million. So this is, this is not really a new phenomenon. Yeah. Just to give you a, a couple of points here, I just looked at the park plaza and it's 77% drop and just around it shops on Maine and white plains. It's a smaller, smaller loan, $32 million, 77% drop. Uh, the North Texas retail portfolio, Chapel Ridge shopping center in Indiana, in Indiana, Lakeland town center in Florida, well point office tower in Woodland Hills, all 70 plus percent drops. So, you know, it's not out of the, I shouldn't say it is, it definitely is out of the ordinary to see these big drops, but in a, at a time like this, you know, not everything is dropping just 30%, right? On the other side of the coin though, we do have, I mean, it's only a handful, but we do have some, and we've talked about them in the past, like uh, one Emerson Lane, 660 Madison, uh, Tanglewood Terrace, a couple of other places where you actually have increases in the value. And you, and you do have things like Jamaica Center, which came out this week, and we'll be writing about next week where the value was dropped, but it remains above the loan balance. So, you know, what was a 60 LTV might be a 90 LTV now, but those that look at the value still consider it above um, the security or it's above the loan balance. So have we started to see a lot of ARAs flow in yet or no? We, we do see them look once, at that the, next time. once the value falls, they usually go hand in hand. Yeah, right? we should sometimes look at that they, for next time. Sometimes they, they lag. I do have a couple of other um, retail headlines that came in this week. Um, again, something we'll put out tomorrow. It'll be a list of um, loans that you'll see on our website, but Preet, P-R-E-I-T, the Philadelphia-based real estate investment trust. Uh, there was a story from the Philadelphia Inquirer today saying that uh, they may be going through a prepack bankruptcy. They have a lender willing to lend them $150 million, but it may have to take place through the bankruptcy process. We have assembled a list of loans for which Preet is the owner of the collateral and is the sponsor of the loan. So that will be on our website tomorrow morning. There was another story. Um, I forget this, where this is from. This might be from Delaware.com. Macy's trying to utilize two stores on a pilot basis as fulfillment centers. One is in Colorado and one is in Delaware. The one in Delaware is in the Dover Mall uh, it backs an $80 million CMBS loan. It lost to Sears a couple years ago. Uh, I believe it also had a Chuck E. Cheese and a, and a movie theater. So it's um, a property that's been kind of heavily exposed to industries that have been hard hit in addition to the typical COVID stuff. The Dover Macy's, I believe, is now closed uh, and will be used as a fulfillment center, which uh, kind of changes it, its application. The property is only 67% occupied at the moment um, and is with a special servicer. So a lot going on with this. It, it, that loan is part of a 2011 deal. And then lastly, well, I have two more. Can I go with two more, Martha? Go ahead. Uh, on the positive side, commercial uh, Green Street's commercial mortgage alert uh, revealed last week that Simon is close to refinancing a $350 million loan in Elizabeth on an Elizabeth, New Jersey mall. If that were to go through, uh, that would be a terrific uh, sign of hope for the market that uh, it would be the first time I believe we see a big mall loan since the pandemic began and it may st start the process for others who have been waiting on the sideline looking to refinance uh, to be able to actually tap the credit markets. Uh, that would be terrific. And then lastly, Barclays and CNBC put out a piece which said that um, if malls and shopping and department stores were converted to warehouses, the value of those warehouses would only be about 10% of what they are on a retail basis. So take that for what it's worth, but um, it's one reason to root against uh, Macy's turning too many of these department stores into fulfillment centers. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the point of that is that the rent that you can charge on a per square foot basis uh, is 
much lower, right, for an industrial property because really industrial properties have high ceilings. They're very large. They're near highways, but not necessarily, they don't necessarily have to be uh, right in the center of population centers or anything like that where malls want to be. Um, but think of all the other things that a mall has, right? It's got elevators. It's got uh, the, what are they called? The fountains that Manus falls into when he's five years old. Uh, they've got all these fixtures and different levels and everything else. So there's like, you know, the retailers are paying for that value uh, when they rent the space, including the parking lot and everything else. So I think it's, I don't think that most people are thinking that they're going to turn the entire mall into an industrial kind of distribution center. I think what they're thinking is we can take part of it have it be a fulfillment center for Amazon or Walmart or, or Macy's or whatever it is, take the other part, turn it into an urgent care clinic, you know, some flex office space. Maybe you can build a tower at, at one point, 18 stories high and put in some multifamily. And then I think the biggest thing, and Lonnie brought this up in one of our podcasts, uh, is the parking. Like the parking uh, spaces are underutilized right so if you have all this acreage of of parking lot you can probably change the usage potentially change the zoning or just start selling out parcels well we're talking about parking it just kind of reminded me of something from this week i had to take a day trip to atlanta and I end up going there, I would say, maybe every three or four months uh, for one reason or another, sometimes business, sometimes pleasure. And as I was driving out of Atlanta yesterday, and it wasn't even rush hour, it was four o'clock, the amount of traffic on that 14-lane highway was extraordinary. You would not know that there was a pandemic going on uh, based on the traffic that I saw there yesterday. It was really unbelievable. And this is from a guy who spent so much time on the LIE on Thanksgiving or the dreaded Van Wick of Seinfeld fame or the, uh, the Belt Parkway around Brooklyn. You know, if there's one thing I know, I know traffic. And this was impressive by any measure, how many people were on the road yesterday. It was really, really mind boggling. Well, I think we, I think we all have a New York bias because in New York, most people, commute to work via mass transportation. If you go outside of New York, that's not the case, right? And all these like ring road cities and uh, Charlotte and Raleigh and Greenville and, you know, all those types of places, Columbus, like everybody drives to work. And that's just, that's so odd from someone like to see from someone like me, who's been taking Metro North to the city since I was like 13. Well, I will say this, that if people are looking for economic green shoots, that was an enormous economic green shoot for me. The number of people that were apparently, I mean, they couldn't be coming from a ball game, right? They weren't coming from playoff baseball. They weren't coming from uh, a music festival. They were all coming from work, it would appear. Uh, for that many people to be on the road at four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, you know, heading north from Atlanta through the Atlanta suburbs is just uh, crazy. I wonder if there's an Atlanta version of Manus Clancy who has his own little index, but instead of it being the 5 p.m. train home from Metro North index, it's the when is it busiest on the highway index. And if it's really busy at 4 o'clock, not so good. If it's really busy at 5.30 or 6, that's good because people have work to do. If we had any entrepreneurial spirit or foresight, we would have driven around the country and dropped those little rubber things on the highways that people drive over yes. that count the number of wheels that are going over them so that we could share that with our, our listeners. You're not going to believe this. There were, you know, 14 million wheels that went over this uh, rubber hose on <laughs> I-85 north of Atlanta yesterday. And just two months ago, it was 4 million. I was actually thinking about how cool it would be to do that in uh, and I'm, I bet you a hedge fund has done this, uh, but to do that in drive-throughs of specific chains, like I have a McDonald's not far from me. If I just put it there, I wonder if that's an, an indicator of how McDonald's is doing nationwide. And if we did put that rubber 
hose across the uh, the highway. There'd be Steel City Dave probably on the side just jumping up and down on it yeah. just to troll us. Two more retail stories. One is from our, our sister company, CRE Direct. We've had the managing editor on our, on our podcast before. They had a story about asking rents in Manhattan declining significantly. Joe? Yeah, so I think it was about something like 12 or 13 percent year over year drop in uh, ground level retail in Manhattan. Manus touched on it a little bit, but the interesting thing that I found was that that trend had been not that level, but that trend, that downward trend had been occurring for multiple years before COVID. I think, which kind of makes sense. I mean, retail in general has been trending downward, but those areas where uh, the rent per square foot is just astronomical in Manhattan. It was becoming less and less economical for these. Economical? Is that a word? Yes, I think it, is. it is. Economical for, uh, I've been talking so much today, my, my brain is forgetting what real words are. Uh, it became less economical for them to be kind of putting these money losing stores on Fifth Avenue just for the cachet of it. I always looked at those things. You, know, you walk up Madison Avenue and there's the David Yerman store. And you have to think that there are some weeks where maybe three of the days they don't sell a single bracelet. Yet somebody's standing there, you know, they're pumping air conditioning into it. A lot of times they're pumping air conditioning onto Madison Avenue because the doors are wide open. <laughs> um, they have security. Uh, so for me, it was always a head scratcher, right? Well, how, you, uh, how you make this work. I've definitely purchased multiple items from that exact David Yerman. So, and I think if you purchase one item from David Yerman, you've covered their daily rent. They so. look great on you. I gotta say, you like the. You know. <laughs> I love the bangles with my birthstone. That you know? is scary. <laughs> and Joe pointed out that in a terrible twist of irony, Amazon has released a catalog. Yeah, so I think it's is Prime Day coming up. It's at some passed. Point? Oh, it's passed. It already happened. Oh, it was geez. delayed, but it was. I'm a little worried about the beginning that. Beginning of this week. Check the credit card bill. Um, so yeah, I've I opened up the mail yesterday, and there it is. It's a beautiful, in real life printed, Amazon catalog, and it's all. They must know that I have a kid from the stuff we order. It's all toys and games and all this other stuff and Kindles and and I said. It's kind of amazing that a digital only delivery service that I can open up on my phone is actually sending me what equates to a Sears catalog from 20 years ago. Or the Toys R remember the Toys R Us catalog before Christmas where you'd yes. circle everything in the catalog. Uh, so maybe we're not far off from Amazon actually just occupying all the old Sears stores, right? Maybe we'll come totally full circle on this. I remember getting those catalogs as a kid. And the thing that I always circle year after year after year, and met all my buddies too, and my cousins and so forth, were those Aurora car sets, right? You would just kind of power up the, the little matchbox car and you put it on the track and you'd race against your buddies or go through a thousand miles an hour, usually shooting off <laughs> the track at, at one end and narrowly missing, taking the eye out of your aunt. I thought it was you know, going to be that a Red the, Rider BB gun. <laughs> no. <laughs> I could see you being one of those guys with the, uh, you know, with the lamp, with the leg. You know, are you a, a leg lamp guy from that movie? The leg lamp. The electric, electric <laughs> lamp. Fragile. Sex, yeah. <laughs> I can see that being a popular thing in the uh, McBride household. So. <laughs> That's the Christmas story reference for those who. For, for don't the know. day. Don't every, know that. Pretty much every podcast we either reference that christmas story or it's a wonderful life or forrest gump so just just try and keep up out there so uh just to round things out from a data perspective um i did some because we've been talking about it and talking about it and i wanted to really look at some real numbers the what we would call the shadow delinquency rate now again this is something i i kind of ran on my own but then again, I've been running queries at Trump for a really long time. So I think I trust myself. Uh, I looked at a couple of things. So I looked at all the loans outstanding as of September that are marked as current in their delinquency status 
but that have a paid through date at least two months prior, right? So if I look at um, lodging, let's say, and retail, they're pretty close. Loans that are current, but haven't paid since July or earlier, in lodging, it's about 2% of the current status bucket. And in retail, it's about 2.3%. That equates to about 1.4 billion in lodging loans and about 2.6 billion in retail. And uh, if we look at all the, the rest of the property types are really low numbers, but if we look at the whole universe, it's about 4.3 billion outstanding that are in this current, but haven't paid in a few months category. Now, a lot of these could be in forbearance agreements, um, so they're you know properly not paying, but that's a number that we should definitely keep our eye on going forward because you know no matter what agreements you're in, the the farther away it's been since your last payment, it's probably not so good of a, a deal. Now, so if that's we, interesting. Well, I'll yeah. just let interrupt for one second. So the the four point three billion would probably equate to eighty five basis points. That's so, exactly right. So that's eighty four. Let's let's come on, come on, Manus, you're better than that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking, and we didn't stage that, by the way. We uh, I came up with that kind of just uh, did. with my, my fingers and my toes. Nobody's even seen this data until I'm talking about it right now. <laughs> so we were at just under 9%. So we're now talking about the real delinquency rate being closer to 10. But if what you're saying is true, and I, and I believe it is, it means that there's another $26 billion of foreborn loans for which the pay-to date and the, and the status should be kind of aligned. And it goes back to that issue we were talking about at various points that sometimes the data can become a little bit messy and opaque. Right, right, right. So you're saying that the, the forbearance loans had their paid through dates moved up or no? Um, a lot of those were current, but the paid through date was also current right. as well. Oh, okay. okay. So the but even though they probably could... haven't paid or maybe they have paid, but it came out of reserves or whatever. Right. Got it. So this 4.3 is an additional, in right. addition to whatever we counted as forbearance. So just a couple more data points before you all fall asleep. Um, these are for our very data centric listeners out there. I'm a, I know there are a few. Um, if we if we relax the criteria and make it a little bit more, I guess, conservative, if I guess that's the way to put it. And we look at their current but their paid through date has not reached September yet. So they're a month or more behind. So that includes those grace period loans. The numbers increase dramatically. Uh, so for lodging, it goes from 2.03% to 8.43%. And for retail, it goes from 2.3% to 6%. So in dollar terms, that's about 5.8 billion in lodging and 6.9 billion in retail that are marked as current, but haven't paid in September. Um, and that's 4.48% of, not of the entire universe, but 4.48% of all loans that are marked current are actually haven't paid in, in September. So the back of the envelope number says that if those are truly delinquent numbers or become delinquent soon, that would be like another 270 basis points of delinquency, give or take. So here's your math. Now, my delinquency rates might be slightly different than what the delinquency report put out, but it's based on the same universe. So it just depends on timing of when we pull the data. So the um, real delinquency rate that I see here, or I should say the, the stated delinquency rate for everything is about 8.6%, 8.63%, right? If we use that first version where we look for stuff that's at least two or three months late, then it's 9.5%. If we look at everything that hasn't paid in September, it's about 13%. Wow. So Yeah, that kind of passes the sniff test of what we were talking about yeah. last month where we said that uh, when you look at this stuff, the shadow number is probably, you know, three or 4%. And, and so your numbers seem to be um, what we would expect. Yeah. And in lodging, it's... 30% if we use that kind of more relaxed standard and in, in uh, retail, it's 20%. So, I mean, obviously this is all kind of mo a moving target, but I'm trying to get some sense of the stuff out there that's not obviously delinquent in the data, but that we can kind of infer. So 
that's my data dump of the day until we talk about banks. We had a trading alert about value of CMBX 6, and it was an interesting story around Houston office. Yeah, I'll run through a couple more um, tripwire stories. We already talked about the retail segment. Uh, two this week that were of interest, one not so good and one pretty good. Uh, the first was a story about the Pinnacle at West Chase. It is a 470,000 square foot office in Houston. Um, it, it backs a $69 million loan. That loan is part of CMBX 6. Um, with that derivative index, we usually talk about exposure to malls. But in this particular case, it's an office loan that uh, probably is giving Long's uh, some agita today. The office was valued at $117 million in 2012. Um, the value was lowered this month to $37 million. So it's about $32 million underwater. We've been covering this story since 2013 when Phillips 66 started looking around for new headquarters. Uh, Phillips 66 vacated in 2016 and the property is currently 23% occupied. So uh, a real um, hefty loss perhaps coming down the pipeline for that asset if the owners can't um, backfill the tenant base uh, in short order. Um, another one we looked at, the Dulles view, this is a happier story, a 360,000 square foot office in Herndon, Virginia. Um, it has landed three new leases which total 25% of its GLA. Uh, its GLA is about 360,000 square feet. We've been watching this loan for a while as well. Um, the debt service coverage ratio um, dropped to 0.84x uh, for the trailing 12 months ending in March 2020, and occupancy was 56% uh, after the building lost a big tenant. Uh, it might have been Time Warner, but I, I have to go back and check my notes. So this this was a property that was... Uh, of concern for us due to low occupancy and uh, low debt service coverage ratio. Now we should see its occupancy bump up by about 25 points, which should hopefully take this property out of the woods and uh, restore it to something that is not of concern. So that would be a, a terrific thing for CMBS investors. We released a hotel MSA report this week that showed where exposure lies and Houston was at the top of the list for the delinquency rate. Yeah, Houston well, is in the uh, dirty half dozen, uh, we might say, <laughs> right? In terms of cities with uh, big hotel problems. Well, and there were problems before COVID, right? We, we saw a lot of issues in the office market as well, which you would think ripples through to the lodging or the hotel industry, right? If there's fewer people working in the area, fewer people traveling in to have meetings and all that type of stuff. Uh, if I look at... Um, just Houston, I see in this appraisal stuff that I was talking about before, I only see a few. Uh, some of, I think one of them Matt has already talked about, but I see Hilton, Houston, West Chase, and Hilton Garden Inn, Houston Bush Airport, and Crown Plaza, Houston Katy Freeway with 66, 50, and 46% drops in value uh, that have occurred over the last few months. So, um, I don't think Houston's alone in seeing big lodging drops, but uh, the oil bust in 2016, I think they're still feeling those ripple effects today. Well, with regard to those properties, several of them, the borrowers had indicated that they're ready to throw in the towel and transition the property back to the lenders, which is quite, kind of interesting, right? I, we were on a um, panel this week for an investment bank addressing uh, the hotel industry. And, you know, people were asking, what is the decline in value? And last week we talked about how, based on appraisal reductions, we thought that valuations were down 30% from a third-party valuator point of view um, at that point. That was, you know, now a month ago. But it felt like more from our position. And the point was that we made on this, on this particular call was that if you had a hotel that had a 60 LTV when you made it, and you're willing to toss back the keys now, it means two things. It means that you've lost more than 40% of your value since the time when the loan was made. And it's probably not 41%. If it was 41%, you'd probably try to ride it out. You've probably lost 50% of your value. 
And beyond that, you don't see the market turning around quick enough to avoid reaching into your pocket to sustain this thing um, for the year or two it takes for the market to recover. So, you know, uh, position that against the numbers Joe gave a few minutes ago about valuation drops and a 50% drop in the market for uh, hotels, the price of hotels sounds about right. In the past week, the New York Times has highlighted that multiple corporations have pushed their return to office to the middle of 2021 officially. So what does that mean? <laughs> it means that the house I'm buying uh, is going to be well used uh, at least for the next uh, seven or eight months. Um, I think Google was ahead of the curve here. I think when, remember, I think it was actually September, no, sorry, June or July when they came out and said, we're not coming back to the office until mid next year. And everyone kind of said, wow, that's crazy. That's a year from now. You know, how can you make that statement? And I think it, <laughs> I was probably one of those people saying that in hindsight, it makes a lot of sense because then there was no question of, well, when are we going back? What are we thinking? You know, uh, all this kind of back and forth and uncertainty. They just said, listen, we're going to, we're going to buckle down and work uh, from home until at least next summer and kind of took a lot of the uncertainty away for their employees. I think that was in hindsight, a good move. Now, what does it mean for this office? I mean, that's, I that can't mean anything good, right? Casey Conway talked about, you know, the per square foot expected rental rates in office are going to take a real hit. Uh, it's going to, I think it's going to be staggered right? Because we have office uh, leases tend to run five, seven, 10 years. So for every single building, you know, if you're a landlord, you're, I'm praying that you signed a bunch of 10 year leases in January, you know, because I think most corporate tenants who are credit tenants and, and fairly large corporations will still pay their rent. Uh, but if you have a bunch of leases coming up in the next couple of years, it's going to be very hard to be able to renew at the same rates, I think. I have a somewhat far afield view of the office market at the moment. And it has nothing to do with, you know, the prospects for the office market. It's more of a, an observation about life in America right now. And, you know, there's been a lot of headlines over the last couple of weeks about how football viewing is down. Uh, basketball, the NBA finals was supposedly down big, baseball down big. And you would think that right now this would be, you know, an amazing period of time, everybody in front of their TVs, right? Everybody home, nobody working in an office late, right? Can't go outside, can't go to dinner, that this would be the salad days for ratings of these sports. Um, I think part of it is you don't have that water cooler banter where people just walk by, have a cup of coffee and say, hey, did you see the Chiefs game last night? And you start talking about Patrick Mahomes, um, or Russell Wilson, or the Tampa Bay Devil Rays game last night, right? There's none of this interaction which reinforces what's happening and some of the excitement in this game. So it becomes kind of an afterthought. And I think that um, that's not something I saw coming at all. I thought that, you know, I would be watching those empty stadiums for Korean baseball all through the night and then <laughs> flip on Premier League uh, soccer and then watch that all day long and then hop into uh, – NHL or NBA, and, and it's been just the opposite for me. And I think it has to do with, I have nobody to converse with about what's going on in sports. Yeah, well, there's, there's three aspects here. I think one, if, if I want to take a positive view of this, I think that uh, there are more people now outside of their house, walking around, going on hikes, going to the parks, going, so outside activities, right? I think people are dying to get out of their house and we're all sitting in our houses staring at computer screens all day so i think maybe there's some screen fatigue there even though that's kind of sacrilegious as a millennial to say that i think the other thing which is probably more realistic is that some of this some of these sports without fans is just not so fun to watch you know i think football's still pretty good but hockey was tough basketball is tough golf was great and so on right so turning to, we had uh, some European news this week. Yeah, we did have one thing, you know, we're mostly known for our uh, U.S. data, uh, U.S. CRE and CMBS data, but we did notice something 
uh, globalcapital.com was reporting this week that um, for the canal CMBS deal, which came out in 2019, it's a deal backed by shopping centers in the Netherlands that the trustee for the deal or the administrator was going to forego the 2020 valuation of the properties. They, it's, it's like they forfeited. Uh, in short, these administrators have to value the properties for an LTV test. If an LTV test is failed, meaning the value of the property falls below a certain level, then the waterfall on the deal has to uh, be rearranged. It's no longer pro rata principal. Money is curtailed for reserves and so forth. And rather than go out and value the properties in the Netherlands and confirm that they've breached this covenant, I think they just basically uh, said, we know we're going to lose this, uh, this particular trigger. We're not even going to spend the money trying to get this thing valued. Why pay for the autopsy? We, He's dead, right? right exactly. That That's it. That happened also to another property uh, or another deal, the Elizabeth Finance deal, a UK deal. Um, where the LTV had gone from 75 to 94, which caused the cash flows to change as well. So it's the brief educational segment. Um, you know, when these triggers are missed in the uh, CLO market, it could change the cash flows when IC or OC tests, which stand for interest coverage or over collateralization are missed. Or in this case, the LTV test is triggered in a European deal. It changes how cash is distributed to bondholders uh, and in this case, uh, it's kind of like, you know, showing up for your algebra test in ninth grade and uh, taking the test and just handing it back in and saying, you know, I know I was going to get a zero, so I'm not even going to even try to, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, multiply X times Y and, and figure out, uh, you know, what these things are worth. That reminds me of a story. And usually Manis tells the college stories, but it reminds me of a story. I took, you had to take a science you know, entry-level science class as part of the curriculum uh, at the Jesuit college that I went to. So a lot of people took astronomy, right? And it was a night class once a week. A lot of the football kids were in there. You know, it was really supposed to be like a, a coast-by type class. Practically adult ed. <laughs> and, well, the very first test was very difficult. It was really hard. And, you know, for... Someone like me, who usually did pretty well in school, I was usually kind of just totally goofing off or zoning out in class, so I didn't do very well, and neither did anyone else. So I, I took the class with my roommate. Maybe he's a listener. I don't know. I haven't talked to him in a long time. And at the end, <laughs> when we got back and he gave back the test, the professor said, so what, do you got, what did you guys think? I mean, no, everyone did really poorly, and he was kind of like downtrodden. And we're in this lecture hall of like 300 people, and it's about half full and we're all the way up in the top and my roommate raises his hand and the professor calls on him and he goes, I think Galileo would have failed that test and the whole place erupted. And needless to say, the next two tests were like, you know, here's a picture of the moon. Is this a waning gibbous or a waxing gibbous? <laughs> so. True or false, the moon is made out of green cheese. <laughs> So that's, that's, uh, that's a line I will always remember. Galileo would have failed that test. So let's move on to the shout outs. We have a few to go through this week. And the first is uh, one of our multi-podcast outreach listeners, and that's Ralph D. So Ralph D., um, who is a very uh, avid listener, and we love uh, getting his comments after each uh, podcast. He was actually quoted in a institutional analyst uh, article this week, and which was then picked up by Zero Hedge. So definitely go check that out. Um, Ralph D is is pretty bearish on CRE and CMBS. So uh, as you can, I guess, tell by anything that's picked up by Zero Hedge is usually pretty bearish. And then we have Mike D who recommended our pod on Twitter, Mark M dash s he is a hyphen so those are both his initials he's actually a trep alum who listens to the podcast and likes our european and uk news which i thought was very kind of him and one of my favorites andrea s from wisconsin and her sons grayson who is nine going on 10 and soren seven 
So we've got a couple of very young converts and listeners on a regular basis. Joel R. from Georgia, who listens when he's walking the dog, and he loved the Cecil content. And Joe, he wanted to mention IFRS 9 was something that you failed to mention in our educational segment. <laughs> apologies. Uh, very deep apologies to Joel R. So IFRS 9 is, and I'll take 10 seconds. IFRS 9 is the European version of CECL, or should I say CECL is the American version of IFRS 9. And IFRS 9 came in pre-CECL. I forget when exactly it was implemented. It was at least a year or two or three before CECL. Uh, it, there's a little bit more, it makes a little bit more sense than CECL. I'll just put it that way. And we have some clients who use our models to inform uh, their IFRS 9 calculations also. Not surprising. Joe, Joel also said it takes a lot to bore him. So I think Cecil is definitely something that you could talk a lot about. And then we had George who commented on the pod uh, that we had with Casey Conway. And I quote, this is gold, he said about the podcast. So thank you for that kind comment. And then I can't overlook our own Tom Fink who quoted our podcast with Casey Conway to an ESG steering group about the implications of ESG on real estate and capital markets. So ourselves are quoting ourselves, which is interesting. Well, I, I got some exciting news, you know, now that we've done the, the shout outs, is that uh, we learned that uh, Keegan is working on establishing some swag for us, that we are going to get t-shirts um, for some of our shout out listeners so that in the future, if we shout you out, it will be uh, it'll come with uh, a T-shirt coming your way for uh, the Trep podcast. We haven't figured out what's going to be on the T-shirt yet. It's going to be either uh, the four of us sitting on the hood of a Corvette with our arms crossed, kind of like a, a cheesy, ZZ top, 1980s music video uh, look. Or maybe, as Keegan kind of pointed out, maybe something like Abbey Road where we're walking across uh, a street in London. But... You know, we're, we're working on that. And uh, in the meantime, you know, we're trying to come up with other giveaways. You know, we're, we're trying to work out something with Wawa where, you know, if you go in there and you order a 12-ounce cup of coffee, you could upgrade to a 16-ounce just by naming the, the Trep podcast. You know, that's, that, that's not in the works yet. So don't, don't try that at your local Wawa just yet. We're still uh, trying still to paper that the details. one. Yes. <laughs> but the T-shirts are coming. That part isn't a joke. Well, I want to – I want – the Midtown uniform. So if anyone's on Instagram, they follow Midtown uniform. It's the, uh, the Patagonia vest. I'm not a real big Patagonia vest guy, but if we had one that said Trep wire on it, maybe with like, you know, Clancy across the back, like it's a, like it's a basketball Jersey or something. I, I would definitely be in for that. And now let's turn to the deal of the week. The deal of the week. <laughs> deal of the week. I love this one for, for many, many reasons. Um, you know, I like to, when I can, point out um, unloved parts of the market, um, things like hotel deals and retail deals, particular, particular in this market. We talked earlier about Simon trying to refinance their mall. Here we have Target is going to open a new store in Yonkers, New York. Uh, it turns out it's about two or three miles um, from where I live for many years. It's near the Yonkers Raceway where the trotters and the pacers run three times a week, starting at seven o'clock at night. Um, because I live nearby, it was a great destination to take a child that couldn't sleep. So if your kid was screaming, uh, you know, late at night, not even late at night, you know, 8.30 at night, you put him into bed and you just had to get out of the house. You drive three miles to Yonkers Raceway. Your kid would see the horses running around with the guys on the back. And uh, it was a great time killer on a, on a beautiful spring night. So Target's going to open a new store where there used to be a Sears. It used to be the Sears that had the highest per square footage sales in the entire country, yet it still couldn't make it. So it closed in 2019. Before that, it was a John Wanamaker's uh, part of the Cross County Mall. Mark's Realty announced that it had signed a 130,000 square foot lease uh, with a 40-year term with Target. They had also signed on H&M for 28,000 square feet at the mall uh, at the same time. The property is owned by Marks and Benenson Capital. 
They've owned the asset for 65 years. So the mall predates rock and roll, right? It was built in 1954, even before Bill Haley and the Comets released Rock Around the Clock. Mark Alteris, I think I'm pronouncing that right, repped Mark's Realty in-house for the deal. And Jeffrey Howard of Ripco repped Target. So it's great to see a, an empty parcel in Yonkers get filled up with uh, Target. So uh, I have a deal of the week of my own, uh, and it is <clears throat> Joe McBride of Joe McBride and Samantha uh, LLC uh, has agreed to purchase a property as per Manis's suggestion to get a property with some land far away from the city, uh, repped by, uh, double repped by Houlihan Lawrence of Westchester. Uh, and I hope I don't jinx it. I'm waiting on the contract of sale to come through. But uh, there you go. I'm another dang millennial driving up the house prices in the suburbs. Congratulations. <laughs> and if you want to know which neighborhood precisely will be going to hell, <laughs> ping us and we'll give you the address. Exactly. Podcast at trep.com. So let's turn to banks. The big banks had their Q3 earnings reports this week, as we had alluded to earlier in the podcast. And it looks that the banks with concentrations in capital markets performed better than their peers. What's That's happening? right. Yeah. So I have a bunch of stuff to walk through here. So uh, bear with me. I think there's a couple of things I wanted to, especially given what we do and the fact that we've talked about reserves and CISL and expected losses for the last few weeks, I wanted to touch on that too. But just overall, if we look at the big six, uh, Wells Fargo uh, had the pretty much the worst earnings out of all these, uh, the big six. They were uh, more than 50% off uh, year over year on earnings. Citigroup was around 30-ish percent off. Bank of America was negative, but not too negative. JP Morgan was fairly flat on earnings, although they were positive. Morgan Stanley and Goldman both had very nice positive uh, earnings. Goldman almost had a hundred percent increase uh, year over year. And obviously Goldman is, you know, of all those banks, they're probably the most known for their trading and their trading revenues were up 30%. Um, I think Morgan Stanley's trading revenues were up 20%. B of A's were up 4%. So uh, it's kind of like the reverse of everything we've been talking about for many, many years, which is the banks with, um, you know, more active in uh, fee-based uh, things like wealth management were uh, the rage. And actually Morgan Stanley is one of those, even though they had a nice, they still had a nice quarter. Uh, a couple of other banks that um, to talk about briefly as we, we look through the transcripts of their earnings calls. A quick hat tip to MK, who pointed this out to us. Uh, he too was parsing the uh, earnings transcript calls for the banks, looking as so many of us are for um, signs of what valuations are and what distress uh, levels are. Uh, he pointed out two. Uh, one was PNC, which owns Midland, uh, as many in the CMBS market will know, and Midland is a big special servicer to the CMBS market. Um, in their earnings transcript, uh, one of the questions came up about loans in special servicing. Uh, and, and the people at PNC noted, um, there seems to be a much bigger willingness of the BP's buyers in, in this cycle to work with borrowers um, to get relief over the goal line. Uh, that was one comment, you know, banks in general for their own portfolio uh, have much more flexibility than CMBS. Um, PNC was noting that the BP's buyers are not really flexing their muscles right now as much as they're trying to accommodate um, borrowers more so than in the past. Uh, they also noted on that call that there's lots of capital on the sideline. So that if a deal can't be made, um, there is money out there supporting asset prices, which we kind of gave you the gloom and doom of valuations for hotel and retail earlier, this is the other side of the coin, that there is a lot of uh, capital out there um, to pick up these distressed assets, which may keep losses from being as big as they might otherwise have been without uh, that flow of capital. Uh, separately, Truist, 
which is the merger between BB&T and SunTrust, I believe. Um, in fact, it, I know it to be true because SunTrust Park in Atlanta is now Truist Park. Um, they noted in their call that they had sold 300 million of notes um, backed by hotel and energy credits, right? Those would be two things that were really hard hit in this downturn. So the fact that they were able to move those um, at what they called good pricing uh, is another positive sign for the market and probably an indication that there's, um, as PNC said, uh, a swath of capital out there to deploy. So those are you know, some good signs out there for the market. And we thank MK for his uh, pointing this out to us. So it's interesting that BP Spire uh, comment is interesting. Um, they they must think that there's uh, a better, higher potential return in you know working with these guys instead of foreclosing. I mean, nobody wants to foreclose on a property right now and try and sell it, right? Yeah, I was talking to somebody a long timer in the market who has been both a regulator and has worked on the uh, brokerage side of the business over the years. And his philosophy has always been uh, your first loss is your best loss. Meaning the first time you get, you know, the earlier you can get out of a position, the better off you are. The longer you carry these things, the more costs you endure, the more the, the property atrophies, the long that, longer the property sits vacant, um, the bigger your loss is going to be. And um, it'll be interesting to see over these next coming months, how quick um, BP buyers and special servicers are to pull the trigger and make note sales and uh, try to get these off their books as quickly as possible. Well, we're in a different time now too, because most of these guys have to hold this stuff due to risk retention. So there's no, there's no exit on the bond side. There's only exit on the loan side. Um, so I know we're, we're going long here, but I just want to point a couple of things out on the, uh, the big six earnings. So their reserves, uh, which is basically their putting aside money in expectation of future losses. Essentially, if we want to, if we want to be very simple about it, in Q2, they everybody doubled their reserves, right? Some people, you know, a little bit more. Some people, less, some banks, a little bit less. But the idea that of doubling reserves is pretty amazing. It was, uh, and don't again, don't quote me. I put these together quickly, but it's about 108 billion dollars across the top six banks that uh, they've set aside for an allowance for loan and lease losses is what it's really called. Their Cecil AL. Now this quarter, the number has barely moved, uh, which is, I guess, good. So they don't. They, their outlook has not worsened. Uh, some of the banks dropped uh, their reserves slightly, uh, but generally they're keeping them steady. And if I look at, uh, and that's like in the neighborhood of two percent uh, of. Uh, outstanding loans. So Bank of America is about 2.07%. Wells is 2.22. Goldman's 3.7. Mo Morgan Stanley's lower than the rest of them. But the couple of themes to, to see is that on the consumer side, which is credit cards, resi mortgages, auto, things like that, their reserves are much higher than on the, on the commercial side, which kind of makes sense historically. Credit cards have higher charge offs uh, than let's say a consumer or a corporate loan. Now, JP Morgan and Bank of America both put out uh, their future expectations for some of the macroeconomic variables uh, that they use in their CECL current expected credit loss analysis. So just to give you a sense, JP Morgan is expecting unemployment in the second quarter of 2021 to be 8.5% down from uh, their expectation of 9.5% next quarter. That is an improvement in their outlook from last quarter by about 50 basis points. Uh, GDP was a similar improvement. So last quarter they had minus 6.2% in, in Q4 20, minus 4% in Q2 21. And all of those levels have improved by eight or five to eight basis points uh, so basically, the economic outlook from these big banks is getting slightly better, uh, which is a positive sign. Yeah, the interesting thing about the J.P. Morgan results, I thought, and it underscores what we've said many times in the past, and we kind of hinted out, 
today, which is really, we, we don't really know where this economy is going, is that they came out and said, it is possible that our reserves are $10 billion too high. If you see the best case scenario play out, which would mean a, a huge uptick in earnings for them uh, if these were to be released. But they also said, if we see our worst case, our reserves could be $20 billion underfunded. So that's a $30 billion swing in what they think their reserves ought to be. And it just goes to show that um, no matter how many quants you have and how many models you have, um, it's really hard to predict what we're going to see six months from now or a year from now. With many of us working from home until 2021, most of us have rethought what we wear as we're doing our work. And it seems a survey of a thousand remote workers says that surprisingly, 52% are still abiding by a dress code. Now, I happen to know that Manus is a very fashion forward individual. So I was curious what you thought about that. Well, I do have a code and that code is, I have something on my back and legs all the time <laughs> when I'm not showering. So I do have that code, but in terms of having like a Vivek like fashion sense, uh, I clearly don't. Um, you know, for me, it's, it's one of three things, you know, and uh, it's a rotation that just kind of goes from bottom to top and then circles through. And it's always just either an Allman Brothers concert t-shirt um, or a K1043 classic rock t-shirt. They used to give those away at the Giant Games all the time, so I probably have 10 of those. <laughs> um, or my old St. Joseph's 35 and over men's basketball league purple classic. I played in that league for something like 28 seasons. And uh, so I probably have 28 different t-shirts from tie dye to gray to purple. And uh, so those, uh, you know, make up my entire wardrobe unless I'm going to a wedding. Mine would be the St. Barnabas uh, basketball t-shirts. I have one in burnt orange, which is a very good one. Uh, but for me, pandemic has been all about the polo shirt and the footwear because nothing is better. Like there's a psychology to this, right? Like if you dress like a slob, you're probably not going to get as much work done. It's just kind of like look good, feel good, play good, Deion Sanders style. But uh, I have a buddy who has a son who's a, at a Jesuit high school in New York City, which shall not be named because they're a very large rival of mine. But they're doing half and half, half the class in, half the class at home. But when you're at home, you have to be wearing the uniform, the full uniform, and they grade you on your Zoom etiquette. Are you paying attention? You're not getting up and walking around. You're not laying in your bed. And I really, I appreciate that. So I think, you know, you got to look the part and dress the part in order to be as effective as you want to be. But at the same time, I love wearing my reef flip-flops or my Ugg with the little, with the furries on the inside. My Uggs with the furries on the inside. I saw Keegan going for the seven second delay button. I thought you were going to say half the kids were dressed and half the kids were undressed. <laughs> Oh, that, that actually is true. Uh, some do admit to wearing their pajamas during work, and some don't. So there you have it. With that, we'll close. Thanks to our producer, King and St. Anjme. Join us next week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question or a comment, send us an email at podcast at trep.com. For more info, visit trep.com and subscribe to the podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right.